The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, it's going to be about coming up on the program today, it's going to be about garden practices that irritate us as well as things that did good in our garden and bad. And our guest will be Amy Andrew Hoetz, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is jam-packed, and it starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you for taking time out of your day to hang out with us for the next hour. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're happy you're tuning in, whether it is on one of the 15 radio stations that's broadcasting our program here in 2021, through a radio app, through our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, under the Season 5 tab at the top of the page. Uh, in studio video, in studio video replay or podcast replay, we thank you for consuming the program. You want to be part of the program? You can certainly do that by a couple of avenues. Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. That's Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com is the way you can communicate with us. And if you want to talk to us during the program, you can give us a call at 1 800 927 show s h o w one eight hundred nine two seven seven four six nine if we can't get to you leave a message we'll call you back pro a big program lined up for you we're going to go over in segment one here garden practices that irritate us and why they do holly yeah um so there's a couple of them and one of them is for me just blindly following internet garden advice so Maybe you see like a little picture thing and it's like if you plant basil next to your tomatoes, then the robins will come and feed your garden or something. And it's like, okay, let's think about the science. That's a bad ex- that's a bad example. You, but you just pulled that one yeah, out of nowhere right. and didn't plan that one out. <laughs> right. I'm trying to think of, you know, just like a like there's companion planting charts, right? right? And there's like one ones will say don't plant basil next to your tomatoes. The ones will say plant them within three feet. 37 charts and, yeah. and 47 different combinations. Right. And none of them make any sense. Or there's these like five-minute videos that say, or what are they called, five-minute crafts or minute yeah, crafts yeah, yeah. or something like they that. They do some ob, ob, just obscene things and, you know, no, nothing in the world. It would never work. It's it's for clicks, and I don't understand the whole purpose of that because they're not ads in it. But anyway, I mean, there was even one I saw the other day where you you smush a blueberry and you put it in a pot, and apparently it grows a blueberry plant. And we all know blueberries want acidic soil, right? So I don't. Well, that's not important to the video. No, that, that's you know they got they got to push through it. We only got five minutes, right? <laughs> right. So just stuff like that, like um, I don't even know. Uh, plant, you know, you can grow an avocado tree, which is probably true. But then people don't think about, you know, what they're going to do with this avocado tree. Right. Once it gets four foot tall in the corner of the, the room, uh, what, what are you going to do now? <laughs> right. But, but, yeah, there's a lot of these. And, and this holds true to some effect on YouTube as well. There are a lot of legitimate YouTube channels that are gardening focused that have, you know, tens of thousands of millions of uh, uh, subscribers. And there are some that are substantially large that is just for show that it all they want whatever i need to say in order for you to subscribe i'll say that so you subscribe so i get more ad sent money well right and that's the thing is like i don't know if people just say stay subscribed once they they figure out that this clown is not giving valid information because we've had people reply to our videos and say how did this turn out you know we right. might we might that show we didn't something. do a follow-up on right it. yeah so I don't know if, they're, if they hold other people accountable or not, but yeah, it's just, I mean, it, it's all over whatever kind of hobby you have, I'm sure. But in gardening, it just seems to be like this, I don't know, fake, fake magical 
whatever. Uh, everything, you know, Goldilocks. Everything's yeah. perfect. Everything's perfect. Um, so that that's one that irritates you. What's another one that irritates you? So I put down plant crack. No, people who <laughs> use the miracle stuff. We're not saying you're bad people. Right. No, no, no. This, but it irritates me. Okay. So this is why. One is that you don't learn anything. Right. You just learn how to feed your plant the plant crack. You're feeding the plant, not feeding the soil that feeds the plant. Right. Now, if you are trying to grow, I don't know, prize-winning state fair flowers, maybe that's okay. Yeah, that's different, yeah. But if you are trying to grow a successful garden, you should really feed your soil, not the plant. Yeah, it's it's on a 7 or 14-day regiment that every you have to feed it with this uh, stuff, the blue stuff, or I guess there's pink stuff too. And it does work, okay? We're not saying it doesn't, but it's not good for the gardener, the experience, the knowledgeable, retaining, I guess, stuff. But it, it, for the for the gardener itself, it's not good for the soil. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for a whole lot of things. It does spur the plant to grow rapidly and, and fulfill the needs that require the plant in order for it to grow. Right. It's just frustrating to me probably because – you know, we grow we, we grow organically. We had to learn how to get a good balance in our soil, feed the soil, all that stuff. And right. I feel like, I don't know, just I feel like well, it's... Well, back to the feeding the soil to feed the plant. Many years ago, we had a sponsor of soil that for our YouTube videos. It was like three years ago. Three, well, yeah. three, four or five years ago. And we had a falling out with him because the manufacturer stuff and the, the soil wasn't no good. And the head rep told you that she goes to garden centers and tells people, oh, you feed the plant and the soil is just the medium for it to grow in. And you corrected her and she was not happy about that. No, it was uh, – the thing is is that they were selling this soil and then also um, – do they sell supplements as well? Uh, like, no, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Uh, it, but it was like she had no clue what was going on. And I get that there are salespeople who are just there to sell X, Y, and Z, and they don't care what X, Y, and Z is. They're just good salespeople. But you, you don't need to know the details. I just need to see a check. Right, exactly. And it's like you're not a good represent, representative of a company, especially people like gardeners. And, and And not to tell too much of the story, but you were on the phone with her, and she said, well, I'll let such and such her boss know. And we said – Oh, he already knows. We left him a message before we called you because we knew where we were going with you on this. Right. And, yeah. It and, the, was... and, the, and the head guy above her said, this stuff ain't no good. The formulation's all mixed up and messed up, but we keep got we got to keep making it because people keep buying it. Yeah. That's what he said. This is a national brand. But anyway. They didn't, they didn't care about no. gardeners. They just cared about their pocketbook. Right. Yeah. So uh, those are two of your irritating uh, garden practices. Here uh, comes Joey's favorite. Uh, one is... <laughs> People who remove or or or, or religiously mo- removing dandelions out of their lawn. Now, dandelions are one of the first flowers that appear in the spring for bees and other pollinating insects. Two, I understand people who want to have this manicured lawn and picture perfect, you know, cover of a magazine, PBS Saturday afternoon special lawn, but. If you are so adamant about removing dandelion seeds from your or dandelion plants from your lawn, and we see this in a lot of just casual, I don't know about homeowners associations. That's a whole other right, deal. Right. But the neighbor, the the yard across the street or the yard next to it is covered in dandelions. Now, here's the thing about dandelions. Number one, there's like 300, 250 different, three hundred different species of dandelions, and all are uh, edible. There are some toxicity potentially in the stem that goes up to the the flower head, so cautious of that. There's beneficial properties of of the entire plant for different municipal purposes, and the seeds can travel up to five miles. So you may be cleaning your yard, or you know a neighbor or somebody who does this daily, digs out the nail lines, and, and is so frustrated because... They keep coming back. Well, a dandelion puffer has hundreds and hundreds of seeds on it, number one. Number two, the seeds can carry up to five miles. So regardless, if everybody in the neighborhood got under the umbrella of dandelion free, they're still going to come in the neighborhood, number one. That, that's that's number one thing. Um, the, the second thing that um, 
irritates us or me <laughs> are what is called potato boxes or potato towers. Now, the tower is more of a woven fence that you integrate straw and I think some soil into it and you grow them in different pockets. But don't people do this with garbage bags or no? Uh, they do. Garbage okay. bags or gar- or, or you know, rubber or 55-gallon drums. That so like of- anything that is kind of stacking. Right. Yeah. I'm talking about the wooden boxes that are two foot by two foot and then you plant one layer of potatoes at the base and as and you cover, you know, put, put a pl- uh, planks, uh, six inch planks or boards up over top of that on the edges and you fill the inside up with soil. And as the plant begins to grow, you put more boards on the side and stack it higher. What is supposed to, I guess they think, is a potato will grow sprouts everywhere the soil touches the stem, similar to a tomato with the hairs. Potatoes do not do this. You'll see these on Pinterest and a lot of social media platforms where you get 100 pounds of potatoes and four square feet. Well, you can go on YouTube and you can type in potato boxes or potato towers, and, and you, these potatoes, will you, the box will get about four foot tall once you get the boards all on them and the soil all filled in as the plant grows up. You will find dozens, if not hundreds, of intro videos about we're building a potato box and you'll find a few, a couple of dozen of the harvest, and the harvest is smaller than the actual planting. The reason being is potatoes don't do that. If they did, there would be billions of success stories about potato towers and how many hundreds of pounds a four foot, a, four, a two foot by two foot, four square foot box could produce. Farmers wouldn't be planting. 32 square mile, right. uh, miles of field, they would just have a couple of thousand boxes that produce 100 pounds apiece. Well, that you see this, you see this, this image on Pinterest, like all over the place, and it shows this potato tower. Um, you can just Google or go to Pinterest and look up potato tower. And yeah, it's just like. It works if you do one layer and then set another layer, grow another, multiple layers in one box, but one layer at the ground level. And you continue to build up, it doesn't work. Otherwise, there would be so many great stories and success stories, and everybody would be growing potatoes in this fashion. Another thing in which uh, is, I guess, you know, an irritating, po- problematic, problematic yeah. is people who grow strawberries in containers on their patio porch and, or deck. Now, there are great devices to grow. You know, Rootmaker has grow bags. Um, there's, there's tower planters. Those are great. Those are fine. But you have to understand the basic under the basic growth cycle of a strawberry. A June bearing strawberry grows 50 weeks a year, stays alive, and then basically produces strawberries for two, maybe three weeks on a good year. June bearing is a little different, but the, the whole deal is you're going to spend all year taking care of this plant for approximately two, maybe three weeks of harvest, and then you take and baby that thing all year round. If you can't put it in the ground, uh, we planted ours in the ground. They grew for five years and got really well, 100 pounds of, probably 100 pounds of strawberries off of it in the five years that we had it. Worked very well. Otherwise, it's not beneficial to grow pota- uh, strawberries in a container on your patio, porch, or deck. It just doesn't work. Right. It's just, it's not ideal. It's, it's, uh, it's very much like a point. We, and when I worked in, um, for this one company, we would talk about what's called point of purchase. And it's something that you, you see it, you get excited, you buy it, and then it's cute. It's cute. It's whatever. It's sparkly. And then eventually the sparkles wear off after you wash it so many times. And, the strawberries don't come back and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it's like, oh, look at this nice little um, strawberry plant that I can grow in my corner of my, my uh, what's it called, deck or whatever. Now, if you dig dandelions out of your lawn, if you grow strawberries in a container or what was the other thing that I had? A pota- or potato you, tower. tower t- if you we, use plant crack. We, we don't dislike you, but we want you to be aware of – you're putting a lot of effort in for a very little, little reward um, when doing these things. 
Right. Basically, we're just we're just trying to bring awareness that everything is not as it it seems on the front side. Well, some of these biggest influencers on social media. Um, well, the the guy who did the the who does the Tesla, what's his name? Uh, uh, Eli Musk. He said that you know a lot of people look at social media and get depressed because everybody's lives is a whole lot better than yours. Well, you only put the good stuff on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that type of thing. Well, there's a saying that if we all threw our problems into a pile, we would quickly grab ours back before we saw everybody else's. Right. Yeah. Well, with that being said, somebody that doesn't have a problem is Walton's Incorporated. They've got a coupon code for you. They can do any. They can. They have everything but the meat in order to get your meals prepared. Whether you are going from animal to edible, or you want some great seasonings to turn that edible meat into really good tasting meat. Right. So we're we're moving. We're you know it's getting to the end of harvest season. Maybe it's getting to. Uh, animal harvesting season and Walton's has everything you need. You can make, um, you know, anything from snack sticks to jerky. They have all the equipment, seasoning supplies to make all that good stuff to your high standard. Walton's also has meatgistics.com, an informational site to help you make the best finished product. And they have their own line of meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's is everything but the meat. That's Walton's Inc., dot com and meatgistics.com. And they've got a new coupon code available for anybody who's interested. Use coupon code GROW22 and save 10% off your order of $50 or more and get free shipping. And that's waltonsinc.com. Well, when we come back, it's going to be things that went well in our garden this year and things that didn't go so well this year. You're listening to Gardening with Joey and Holly Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Do your trees look sad? When we here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show gardens have tree and shrub issues, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch, extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil so you can grow stronger plants. Chemical free, environmentally responsible fertilizer that works. It will put a smile on you and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D R J I M Z. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at Piper and Leaf. Turf experts always say lawn season begins in the fall. It's the time to help grasses recover from summer stresses and thicken up so it can come back strong in the spring. This fall, you can fertilize, aerate, and dethatch your lawn using just one fantastic liquid product. It's called Lawn Force 5, a five-way lawn care kit in a bottle. Lawn Force 5 gives you a lush, healthy lawn you can be proud of. It improves your soil in a way 
that gives your lawn great color using 75% less nitrogen than typical lawn fertilizers. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about this amazing Lawn Force 5 product. That's natureslawn.com. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Waltons Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mini, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Hanging out. Thank you very much for being part of the program today. Watering is an issue that we have all faced in one form or another. Tree Diaper has taken the guesswork out of watering with their innovative devices. The Tree Diaper. How do you water your trees? You likely drag a hose over to it, let the hose run for about half an hour and go do something else. Maybe then you forget about it. Stop doing that. You can increase your water efficiency and save money with the Tree Diaper. No hoses to drag around constantly. Tree Diaper is a revolutionary watering system that will slowly release and stored, slowly releases stored rainwater when trees need it. The tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. Tree diaper will improve the way you water your plants. Every time it rains, tree diaper recharges. Made in the USA. Check out all the sizes they have available. Treediaper.com. That's treediaper.com. And it's not just for trees, uh, vegetables. It works very well on vegetables as well. Well, we're going to go over, uh, going to talk about the things that went well in our garden this year, things that didn't go so well in our garden this year. Not to brag or make uh, ask you to feel sorry for us, but we want to cover these things because you may have had some of the failures that we did, and we want to address those failures so we can all have a better garden next year. And just like we talked about in the previous segment, we're not, you know, um, everything is perfect and it's we got weeds. Sunshine, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of weeds, and uh, that's that's, that's always been a challenge. Now, yeah. With that being said, we converted all over to all raised beds this year. The weed problem has decreased compared to what it would have been if we continued to grow in the ground. Not now. That saying, we still have weeds, but removal of weeds in a raised bed. It's much easier than taking the pitchfork or the garden fork and fluffing the soil and removing the roots from not the greatest soil in the world. So that does help. And, and I don't know the percentile of, you know, X amount this much lower than last year. We still have weeds, but it's much easier to remove them, much more um, easier to go, okay, we're going to do this bed here versus where is our ending point going to be when we are in the ground? And just just like many of you, we have, you know, um, I don't want to say we have a life. I mean, we do, but we have, you know, other Gar- things. We don't live in the garden. We don't live in the garden. We don't have a gardener or we a garden gardening lady. Right. And we're not we're not retired where maybe we can we could spend as much time in the garden as as we would like. Yeah, we're not to the point we are, you know, um, we're busy. People normal with, people, I guess. Normal would, people yeah. with jobs as and normal responsibilities. Some people may classify as being. And hobbies and all sorts of stuff. So, so we got yeah. weeds. We uh, got weeds. Um, onions and leeks did really well this year. Le- they did. The, and the shallots, too. The shallots did well. Much better than we have had in years past. Uh, the leeks are still growing. We'll harvest them probably right before the fr- uh, first freeze. Onions have already grown their cycle, and they are still in the ground. We harvest as we need. Um, but those have done really, really well and very pleased with that. Um, what other things here, Holly? So the tomatoes, they did, I would say we, I would give them probably like a, a grade B, C plus or a B. Right. Um, they did pretty good. They did decent. Not our like overabundance harvest. And actually, I'm okay with that. Um, well, we've dehydrated. Yeah. I mean, we've lost. Tomatoes because of overripening and rotten issues, disease issues. But we forgot to stake them. Soon. Yeah, we we yeah. did some in Florida weave, and the other ones we staked and partially staked, and all this and that. Um, so we did lose some to ground rot, but we have dehydrated the majority of them, and we're still dehydrating them. And whenever the time comes, we will harvest the green ones and uh, probably make fried green tomatoes. Everybody says that's the thing to do. We've never had them. You've never had them. I've never had them. I don't. I don't think I have. I uh, think I tried to make them once when I was much younger. Oh, so yeah. 
So uh, we, we'll probably do that. Uh, we'll kind of reevaluate uh, in one in the raised in the current raised beds that they're in. They're in four foot by sixteen foot beds. There's sixty tomato plants, and the one bed has been grown tomatoes in them for two years. Haven't had much of an issue, and the book quote unquote says you know two years is the maximum. Well, we've never had issues with the tomatoes in that bed. Being the first year, last year, we built the bed, put fresh compost in, raised bed mix. This year, we topped the bed off with fresh compost, but probably put two, three inches in. Next year, we'll top it off again. I don't, there's not been a massive or anything that I see in that bed going, these tomatoes, we can't do this again. They're bad. They're, they're, I, they, they're fine. We will probably put tomatoes in that bed again. Now, if it was traditional ground, Obviously, we would probably we would move them to a different location. I think we should put a, the bulk or like a lot of leaves on those two. Oh yes, for sure. yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll mulch leaves and let them feed the soil, and in the spring, cover the leaves with the remaining compost that we have in order to top the beds off. Drew's and artichokes, uh, they are short uh, this year, which we had this problem about six years ago. Typically, the plants get 12, 18, 20 foot tall, have very nice uh, daisy looking flowers or sunflower looking flowers on them. Uh, they're very short this year. When this occurred multiple years ago, the tubers were not large as you would expect them to be. They were on the smaller side, but we kind of thinned them out, replanted some of the largest ones, and everything took off again. So uh, we haven't dug into that bed yet, but I don't see that there's going to be much of an issue. We've always had Jerusalem artichokes, never had a year where we said, oh, no, we don't have any Jerusalem artichokes. It's a plant that's a perennial that continues to come back year after year without any issue whatsoever. So if you're in a situation, you're in a particular location where you may have the corner of a a lot or uh, an area where you don't like to mow the grass or something of that magnitude, plant Jerusalem artichokes. You can go in there, harvest, the rest set there over the winter, they re-sprout, kind of takes care of itself. Really don't have to do a whole lot. No, they are they're they are good like that. So our cucumbers were hit hit and miss. We had some good ones, some not so good ones, and I feel like that's just how cucumbers are. Yes, I don't um, know. I've never had. I don't think we've ever had a time where it was like we had cucumbers. Maybe the first, first summer, yeah. but that was like a special summer. It was super hot. Rained every three days. Yeah, it rained every three days. Got super hot. Dried out. Rained every three days. Yeah. Dried out. Rained every. You know that With type of thing. Cucumbers coming out of squash, everything. butternut squash, delectica squash, spaghetti squash, all have done very very well. And we contribute that because to the tree diaper. We have those particular plants in beds that the irrigation system from Dripworks is not attached to. So we use the tree diaper in in replacement of a traditional drip irrigation system. And that is the primary reason why we have spaghetti squash is because the tree diaper has kept those plants hydrated and gave them the water that they needed when they needed it. Right. So that's how our squash. And we and we're dealing with powdery mildew right now, but we're technically about 30 days to the end of the season most likely and the plants have already fully developed, so we're not too concerned with that. And it's not affecting the zucchini which is still producing, so mm-hmm. we're just going to leave it be. So the garlic did amazing. I don't know I don't know what happened, but that's okay. We got really good a really good garlic harvest, nice full bulbs and right. uh, just it was it did really well. So we're happy about that. Well, let's uh, we, let's take a look at something that we didn't do very good with, or what we had problems with, which was uh, downy mildew on our basil plants. Now we had uh, big Italian leaf basil, we had dwarf a uh, dwarf basil, and opal basil or a purple basil. The downy mildew hit all of them very badly. The Italian large leaf basil is kind of coming back. The dwarf basil is pretty much gone. The opal basil has re- returned with vengeance and is really producing. Holly, can you explain what downy mildew is and what well, the appearance is? The leaves begin to curl and there's very dark black spots throughout the leaf is the tell sign of what it that does or that the, 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 the effect of it. And it's because of a lot of moisture, a lot of humidity. Yeah, so it's, it's a fungus-like organism that it appears in mid to late summer, which what? is when ours appeared. Right. Um, and then 
when conditions are warm and humid, which we had. We had a lot of rain there yeah. for about two weeks, and this is when that took effect. And it travels via wind or the water getting splashed up on mm-hmm. to the, the leaves. So that's also – so the lower leaves are affected first, and then it moves up on the plant. And so it's just kind of a perfect storm, essentially, and that's what happens. So – um, and the host, the host plant is susceptible, susceptible because of that perfect storm. Um, so the conditions are just right. So if you if you want to help prevent it, um, next year one is pull those plants out and throw them away. Don't put them in your compost right. or burn them or whatever. Um, and don't put them in the city compost. Two, you can use you know like uh, irrigation that can help. Mul- also, we should have mulched. Also mulch, yeah, yeah. mulch helps too. Um, cause obviously, I mean, you can irrigate all you want, but if it's going to rain, stuff is going to splash up. It's going to happen. Yeah. There's not a whole lot we can do about it. Then the other problem that we had, and we're still having it, even though the nights are getting cooler is the peppers are developing on the vine, but they are like slimy and rotting before they get fully developed. Uh, it's a, a bacterial soft rot of peppers. Now, this is not a blossom in rot. It's throughout the actual plant, uh, actual fruit, uh, around the stem where it connects to the, the plant, the, the, the plant down the side. It gets mushy on the bottom. It's all portions of the plant. And this is a bacteria issue that again has some, um, relevance to high temperatures, high humidity and elevated rainfall, which this all started happening. When we had those two weeks of a lot of rain. Yep. So that's, I mean, that's contributed to a couple of our problems. That, that the, you look the at mushy, the, yeah, the you look at the tomato pepper, yeah. and it, uh, the pe- pepper, you touch it and it just falls right to the ground, splatters. Yeah. Um, and it also can be spread in fields where peppers are rotated with crops such as cabbage and potato. I don't think we nope. had well, we either had, of those. We, no, we didn't have uh, pe- peppers in the raised uh, bed from Root Maker. Uh, next to the the shed, we had that in that four by four. That was potatoes last year, but the excessive rain is what I'm thinking is the the main problem right. with this. Yeah, I'm just saying that yeah. if anybody has this issue, maybe they didn't have excessive rain and yeah, maybe... still trying to put together the pieces. Why is this occurring? Could have been from past crops that had this issue that left in the soil. But it also talks about when we did a little bit looking into this, um, you can spread it also by your tools, picking buckets, picking mm-hmm. trays, whatever. And this is one thing Joy and I talk about is washing things with warm, soapy water. And that is something that you want to keep in mind, especially if you're going in containers. If you empty those containers out, you want to make sure you wash them um, year after year. Warm, soapy water. That's yep. all you got to do. Yep. Well, that's just some of the things that did well for us, some of the things that didn't do so well for us. What happened in your garden this year? We'd love to hear uh, what is going on or what did well, didn't do well, you can send us an email, gardentalkradio, gmail.com, or give us a call, 1-800-927-7469. Well, Holly, summer's over. I think that's official now. Nights are getting cooler. Days are getting shorter. And uh, the yard has been forgotten about. Yeah, just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards, those Japanese beetles either. They may be gone, but they're not far. Not only do they feast on your roses and berries this summer, they laid eggs in your turf so that they can start again next year. You can take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets those scarab pests and their larvae. Simply apply the granule with a spreader irrigate into the soil and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is grub gone easy to use, but it the it's the only non-chemical choice that effectively controls those grubs in your soil. And the best part about it, it's non-toxic to butterflies, bees, and other pollinators. In fact, grub gone has zero label restrictions for use around flowering plants. Uh, so you don't have to worry about them taking them back to the hive and toxifying the hive and losing more pollinators. You can find all this out at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. Grub gum, the natural choice. So hang out. We'll be right back with Amy and Andrew Chowsworth, author. You're listening to Gardening with Joey and Holly, radio have a show. question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. 
Tired of dealing with bugs but don't want to use harmful chemicals to repel them? Naturally Green No More Bugs is all natural and plant-based. No more chemical bug repellent. Use it around your home and on you, indoors and out. DEET free and will not stain. Repels mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, flies, and more. No More Bugs is the answer to what is bugging you. Stop using harmful chemicals and use what is safe for you, your family, pets, and the environment. For more information, visit natgreenproducts.com. Natgreenproducts.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit proplugger.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Have essential oils always confused you like they did me? Take out some of the guesswork with Simply Earth. The Simply Earth Essential Oil Recipe Box will help you gain confidence and clarity in using essential oils to help make your home toxin-free. Here's how it works. You receive the recipe box with four pure essential oils, six recipe cards, and extras. Then you learn how to use your essential oils while making the recipes created by certified aromatherapists. Clear and concise step-by-step directions. Save money and detoxify your life. I got to make fun products that will detoxify my home while also learning safe ways to use my essential oils. The best part is these oils don't break my budget. Simply Earth's essential oils are 100% pure and come from the best farms from all over the world. Using essential oils to support your wellness doesn't have to be overwhelming. My home is one step closer to being toxin-free because I made the wax melts and more with the Simply Earth Essential Oil Recipe Box. Visit simplyearth.com to find your recipe box and more. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloom and Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. You got some problems with yellow jackets? We got the tool that will help you rid them off your property. Yeah, during these end of summer months, early fall, when it's a little bit dry, you'll notice more aggressive jack- yellow jackets flying around. Yellow jackets are looking for your barbecue meat, sweet drinks, as well as water sources. You can keep them at bay with the rescue water ye- ye- west- rescue yellow jacket traps. Rescue Yellow Jacket Traps are an eco-friendly do-it-yourself option to help keep these damaging, stinging pets away from you. These traps use a powerful lure for yellow jackets and will not attract beneficial honeybees. All rescue products are made in the USA. You can go to rescue.com to find all sorts of great rescue uh, pest control products. That's rescue.com, made in the USA. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Amy Androhovich is a passionate, all-about-gardening person, indoors and out. She really enjoys providing the best gardening knowledge through her website, YouTube videos, and she has a new book out called Vertical Vegetables. Welcome to the program, Amy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, we thank you for taking time out of your day to join not only Holly and myself, but educating all of us uh, across the country. And and I want to start with this. Many, as we're getting closer to cold weather in the more northern portions of the United States, what are some budget-friendly ways that we can put our garden away or to bed for those who want to until spring next year? What what can what can you advise us on? Well, I tell you what, my best budget-friendly tip for winterizing your garden in the fall is to pile on the leaves. And I think every seasoned gardener would tell you the same thing. You don't you don't need to remove them from your flower beds. Some people think they need to clean them out of the flowers. Nope, just leave them right in there. They're great insulation against the cold, and they also feed the soil and the plants as they break down. Um, And you can also use them to cover your vegetable beds. So whenever I'm raking or mowing up the leaves, I just dump them right over the top of the beds. And you can turn them into the soil if you want or just leave them on as a winter mulch. They're uh, great for attracting earthworms. 
feeding the soil as they break down, and it's basically free fertilizer. Where do you think that mindset comes from where, oh, it's in the flower bed, we've got to get it cleaned up? Is it more of a aesthetic type of mindset that, oh, we've got to keep it pretty rather than just leave them alone? Or, or you know, what, what is, where does that come from? Yeah, I think that that, I definitely think that's it is people, people think, you know, they, they have the mindset of they need to clean those leaves up off of their grass. Otherwise, the grass could die over the winter. They think the same thing about their flower beds. Plus, they look ugly when the, you know when the leaves are all piled in the garden. They can some people can think they look ugly, and I think that that's definitely where that mindset comes from. Is you know I got to do my fall cleanup, which means I've got to clean up all the leaves, and then all those leaves go to waste in in the uh, in the landfill where they are very ben- beneficial to our gardens, and they usually break down you know early on in the spring, and they're gone. You don't even know, you won't even remember they were there. Very true. So we all deal with Japanese beetles, it seems. What's your best me- best methods for handling them? My top uh, way of handling them is I spray beneficial nematodes in my yard every spring and fall. Um, and what those are is those are completely harmless, microscopic organisms that you'll never see. Um, they live in the soil and they feed on grub worms, which are one of the uh, one type of grub worm is the Japanese beetle larva. Um, and so those help to to kill and control Japanese beetles. And they also are the beneficial nematodes also help with other harmful beetles and caterpillars and things, other pests that like to eat our plants. And they help with those as well. So you're getting kind of a double bonus there. I also hand pick the beetles off of my plants in the summertime and drop them into a bucket of soapy water. But I tell you what, I used to stress out about that. And I used to be out there with that bucket every single night. But I've really learned to live with them over the years, and um, I'm not as diligent about picking them. It's very stressful, and it's not a very fun job. You know, Japanese beetles rarely kill, uh, you know, a mature, healthy plant. So they're just ugly nuisance, you know, they're an ugly nuisance. And so sometimes it's better just to learn to kind of live with them a little bit. Yeah, when I moved up here with Holly uh, 2010-ish, I'm from southern Illinois. We had them for years. And then when we moved up here, never saw one for three, four, five years. And now they're they're up here, uh, central Wisconsin as well, uh, just like everything, every other insect or rodent or animal. It's migrating north. So um, if you haven't got them, you will get them. And if you haven't got them, be happy right now because they, yep. will, they will come. <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. I remember the days before Japanese beetles. It was so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk about your, your new book, uh, Vertical Vegetable uh, Vegetables. What is something intriguing our listeners would it, uh, find and that you can encourage them uh, when they pick up a book? Uh, well, the the book is uh, it's the it's really it's a complete bi- guide to everything you need to know about growing um, vet- vertically, growing your vegetables vertically, um, and really anybody can use vertical gardening, no matter how big or small your garden is. Uh, you know, I teach you in the book. I, I teach you everything from you know the benefits of of vertical gardening. You know, different techniques you can use. I give you design tips and tons of ideas, beautiful pictures. Um, you know, how to choose the right structure for your plants and then even go into how to care for them. You know, things like pests like Japanese beetles and and other, you know, watering and weeding and things like that. Um, and then in addition to all of that information, I, I also designed and, and built 23 unique and beautiful projects that and I, I give you the full instructions and all the step by step, everything with pictures so that you can take those and build those in your own garden to get you started. And I think a lot of people, maybe in more rural areas like I was on the farm, the only thing we ever trellised was peas because if you didn't trellis peas, they fell over and, and you didn't have anything until we, I moved to the quote-unquote city when space was a premium. Then you figured out, wow, if I grow everything vertical, get a lot more in a small area, and in some mm-hmm. aspects, by growing vertical, the plant actually produces more than if it was just sprawling on the ground. Yeah. Yep, they produce more, they're healthier, it's easier to weed and water and maintain them for sure, and plus they look spectacular. And easier to to pick those cucumbers. You don't find one the size of a football uh, (laughs) that's always hiding somewhere. That's right, that's right. (laughs) Um, So, you know, many people are afraid of failing. 
if they want to start a garden, they think that they have to be perfect at it right away. What are your top three reasons to convince somebody, somebody that they may be on the fence about starting a garden? And what would you say if they feel they might fail? Well, first of all, nobody was born with a green thumb. No matter what they tell you, they were not born with that green thumb. So don't be intimidated. Everybody has to start somewhere, just like everything else in life, right? You have to learn as you go. Um, And, you know, really another, you know, number two, I would say anybody can be a gardener. You just, you really just have to dig in. And as I said, learn as you go, you know, and and you're going to make mistakes. Number three, you know, there's no doubt you're going to have some failures. Mother nature can, can be brutal. You know, Japanese beetles is one <laughs> one example, um, but you'll you know you're you're more you're going to have more success, successes than you do failures. And I tell you what, when you bite into your first garden fresh tomato or you see that first flower blooming that you planted, you'll forget all about the failures and and you'll just be thrilled with the successes. And, and just like anything, whether you're golfing or you're building a car. You get continually got to do it in order to learn about what you're doing in order to make it good. And you may have seen it on your end at the beginning of the pandemic. Everybody decided, hey, let's plant a garden. And I don't know, and I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I don't know if that, you know, if we had 50% return back this year or whatever since the world has quote unquote got back to get back to normal. But I think a lot of people had failures that first year and was like, well, since everything's back to normal, quote unquote, we're just not going to do a garden this year. And I think they've missed out on a lot of things because of that. Absolutely. You're definitely going to learn more. I mean, take it, take it as a positive. You're going to learn more from your failure failures than you will from your successes. So, right. Well, you love growing succulents. Some people think that that's hard to maintain. They're hard to maintain. What are some good succulent growing tips for people? And Whenever people decide to get one, whether it's a grocery store or the garden center, where's the what is the ideal conditions to keep it growing the way you see it in the magazines and the TV shows? Yeah, from my experience, the number one mistake that people make, the number one thing they do wrong with succulents is overwatering them. So my best tips are to make sure that you plant them in a sandy, fast draining soil. And always use a pot with drainage holes. Don't don't use a pot that's you know a glass jar or something like that. I see people using those without any drainage holes. That's a recipe for failure. And then um, always let the soil dry out completely between waterings. Um, it shouldn't be any moisture left in that soil before you water it again. And once you get the hang of it, and and you know keeping them on the dry side, then you'll you know they really are very easy to grow. Now, for people who may be questioning how dry is dry, would you recommend getting a moisture meter to assist them in making that decision? Yes, a moisture. I recommend that to everybody. The moisture meter is a really brainless way, easy way, is a probe that you just stick right down into the soil, and it shows you right there how much moisture is in that soil. You don't have to get your fingers dirty by sticking them down into the dirt or anything like that. So, yes, absolutely. They're very inexpensive to buy, and you can find them anywhere. That's really great information. And with succulents, now I, I know, like, for example, my house plants I might water once a week. I think succulents, is, is it less than that usually, or what's kind of the, the schedule for that? Yeah, absolutely. Less than once a week. I, in the winter time, my larger, more established succulents, I, I don't think I even water them through the whole winter because they do go into a semi-dormant state. Most of them do during the winter time, so they don't need as much water, especially if you bring them inside the house. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, use that soil moisture gauge or use your finger to stick that one inch into the soil to feel for the moisture. I, I never recommend watering on a, on a schedule, but if you want to do weekly with your other plants, just check the soil and see if it's dry. And if it's dry, add more water. But I tell you, most of the larger ones, you're probably going to find that you're not going to need to water them more than maybe once a month or, or so. Right. I want to go back to the vertical gardening book that that you've got out. Whenever you were creating this book, was there a, whoa, I didn't know you could grow this on a trellis um, experience? Or did everything that you put in the book, was it stuff that you had already knew would grow very well, et cetera, that, that, like that? Yeah, I've been growing vertically most of my gardening career, most okay. of my life, and, and uh, have experimented with every single kind of vegetable that you could possibly imagine. 
uh, growing vertically, whether it be vines and you can do more than just vines on a trellis. You've got, you know, think outside of the box, think about, you know, tower gardens and, and raised, you know, raised gardens and, and containers of all sorts hanging. You could grow just about anything in a container as long as the container is big enough and the, and the, vertical structure is um is strong enough you know you can grow you can grow anything and so the book really came out of you know everything in there is from my experience and plants that that i experimented with and grown myself in my own garden and 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 even in the projects that i built well amy we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us how can people find more out about you and get a hold of that book Oh, the best place to start is my website, Get Busy Gardening, GetBusyGardening.com. I say that a little too fast sometimes. Uh, that's the best place to start. There's a wealth of information there, and you can find my book for sale, and you can also learn more about me. And, of course, you can also find me um, as Get Busy Gardening on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube. And you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter on my website, and that, that uh, gets sent to your straight gardening tips straight to your inbox. Well, Amy, we greatly appreciate the time and the knowledge you've uh, un- unleashed on Holly and myself when it comes to vertical gardening. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answers. You're listening to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy. In-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe. Put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden. Snap on a hose to supply the water. Water on, it pops up. Water off, it drops below ground. You can mow right over it. You can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes. Each quick snap saves thousands of dollars. They install in minutes and operate for years. Visit quicksnapsprinkler.com. Rinse kit, your hose on the go. Pressurized water at your fingertips without pumping or batteries. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on your way out to the garden, beach, or anywhere. Spray it, wash it, rinse kit. Did you know that all flour is not created equal? Janie's Mill carefully stone grinds all their certified organic wheat, rye, corn, buckwheat, and heirloom and ancient grains so that you get every bit of taste and nutrition nature intended. Some flowers really are better than others, and you deserve the best. Get it at janiesmill.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rikon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly Radio Show. Thanks for being with us, keeping us company today on the program. If you got a question, you can certainly send that over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. And if you do have a question in regards to what is this or what insect is doing this or X, Y, Z, include a couple of pictures, GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Uh, far one away, you know, not like a football fall, a foot field away, but, you know, a far one, a close one, a couple of ones in between. Uh, helps us identify and solve the issue in which you're facing much easier. If you'd like to give us a call, you can do that at gar- uh, one eight, not, not Garden Talk Radio. You can't call Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. That doesn't work. You've got to call 1 800 927 SHOW, 1 800 927 SHOW. I had a couple of questions come in this week via phone. Uh, we're going to go to Pam listening to us on Freedom 1570 AM out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Pat. I have been listening to your show um, a fair amount. I'm kind of a frustrated gardener. I have a kind of a back wooded area and trying to plant some pachysandra and some ground cover back there. And I'm getting the last couple of years tons of thistles and with um, burrs and things like that, those weeds. So I'm trying to figure out what can be done about that. I was thinking of goats, but the city of Edina, I don't think, let us have grazing goats. I saw that in a newspaper. But um, 
other than that, I was wondering what kind of suggestions or if you have any ideas about what to do with that, the thistle kind of overgrowing in that area. And I enjoy your show. Thank you so much for your time. All right, Holly. She's got some thistle problems uh, in the back there. What could we offer her as help to eliminate or greatly reduce those thistle issues? Uh, we, we've got an organic and a little more work one, a little organic one, and then one that probably I and you would use. Well, didn't she say she could get cows? Well, you could. She, she was wanting to potentially <laughs> goats, yeah, goats, goats, maybe. Um, yeah. But or, organically, you can just continue to hack them down. Yeah, you can hack them down. You can dig them out. Which they could become, you know, labor intensive because they have tubers that run underneath or, or runners, and they shoot up one plant can shoot off a multiple runners and then pop a bunch of plants up. Uh, Otherwise, you can use anything that has 2,4-D in it. 2,4-D is the active ingredient in broad in a broadleaf spray. We would use this on the farm in pastures. Pastures are large grass enclosed grass areas for animal for horses or cattle consumption. For us, it was uh, cattle, and we would go in there uh, with a sprayer and spray coat the the thistles top, bottom, up, down, underneath. And within 48 hours, it would kill them. Uh, this does not affect the grasses, and that's why we used it in the pastures. It um, or does very well for that. And then we come back a week later and spend another afternoon touching up the ones that didn't quite die or finding new ones. And it, it worked very well. After a couple applications, it removed those. Um, it removed those problems, uh, the thistles, and it worked very well. Now it's not organic, absolutely not. But it is a situation where it could be the answer to the problem to fix it. And then once it's controlled, then doing the organic means of removal would be a better way to go about it. Right. And sometimes that's just how how it is, I guess. All right. Next question. We're going to go to Marilyn listening to us on KHNC 1360, the Roar of the Rockies out of Johnstown, Colorado. Hi, my name's Marilyn, and I'm calling from Fort Collins, Colorado, Zone 5. Um, I have a, a grapevine, too, that have been very successful, but they were killed down below the where it, the hybrid meat, you know, with the roots are on something different than the original or the one I bought. And uh, so that grape, or those vines actually made a couple grapes, and they tasted good. So my question is, can I just trim back the dead old vines and let, because they really never did anything, let the new vines, a couple of them, grow up and see if I can't harvest from them. Otherwise, I'll just dig up both. Uh, my other quick question is, I was very successful planting seed and growing um, uh, dahlias. They're small, they're bushes, but boy, they just are gorgeous. And I want to keep the tubers, but I've never done that. I know gladiolus, I or iris, I would let the green dry back, but these are real green and it's going to freeze any time. So I was just wondering when I'm supposed to pull those up to get the tubers to put away in this winter. All right, Holly, what can we assist her with on the grapes? Now, when she referred to uh, the point where it got cut down, it's the grafting point is what she's referring to, that the the there's a root is different than the top growth, and they graft them together to get an ideal plant um, in order, or an ideal grape to grow. She was referring to, we talked about, I think it was grapes last week on the program. So, um, right. So, anyway, um, you want to, you can trim, you want to trim or prune back those vines. You want to get rid of the old growth. Right. But you're not going to do this now. You're going to do this in late winter. So, like, End of March, middle of March. Before the new buds begin to emerge. Yeah. Yeah. If you do it now, then the frost, the snow is going to be not good to those vines. If you're concerned with not being able to identify the old vines, just take a little twine or a little string or, or a little paint and spray on those uh, so you can properly identify them when everything looks dead. 
uh, right. next spring. Yeah. So, so you want to trim those back then. Right. And mm-hmm. the dahlias. The dahlias. So the dahlias, what you want to do is uh, you, you can you have until after the first frost, after the hard frost. So she's got time. Yeah, you got time. You want to dig them up after the first frost. So, or like first hard, true frost. Mm-hmm. Not like this little, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, teeny tiny frost. You dig them up and then you plant them in May. All right. Hopefully that happens, uh, helps uh, you. Well, with that being said, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? You can certainly do that by going to your favorite search engine and typing in the uh, the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show, or you can uh, send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you a link to the show today. Uh, do not miss next week's program. We're going to go over the art of of composting, as well as house plants, and our guest will be author Eva Eva Monhai, and we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week, for Hi Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.